As I approached the gates of the Taj Mahal, the air felt thick with history and emotion. The sight of the towering marble dome in the distance stirred something deep within me, a sense of reverence for the timeless love that had led to its creation. The crowds around me seemed to fade as I stepped closer, every footfall echoing the footsteps of countless others who had come before me to witness this marvel. Shah Jahan had built the Taj Mahal as a tribute to his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, and that story lingered in the air like a soft whisper. I could almost imagine him walking these same paths, heart heavy with sorrow, yet determined to immortalize his love in stone. The walls seemed to pulse with the weight of that emotion, as though the building itself was alive with their undying bond. As I entered the main courtyard, the Taj stood before me in its full glory, bathed in the soft light of the afternoon sun. The white marble glistened like a pearl against the azure sky, delicate yet powerful. Every intricate detail, from the floral carvings to the Arabic calligraphy, felt like a love letter written in stone. I couldn't help but feel humbled by the sheer artistry and craftsmanship that had gone into its creation. Walking along the garden paths, I was struck by the symmetry of the entire complex. The perfectly aligned trees, the reflection pools mirroring the Taj in their clear waters, it was as though every aspect of the design had been meticulously planned to evoke a sense of balance and harmony. It felt as if the whole space was in perfect alignment with the heavens, a serene testament to eternal love. The sound of flowing water from the central fountain brought me back to the present. It said that Shah Jahan had envisioned these gardens as a representation of paradise, and standing here, I could see why. The lush greenery, the soft murmur of water, and the gentle fragrance of flowers created an atmosphere of peace. It was a place designed not just for the living, but for the memory of the departed, a bridge between two worlds. As I approached the mausoleum itself, the towering archways loomed above, each one inviting me into a deeper sense of wonder. The interior was cooler, the polished marble walls reflecting soft light. Inside, I found myself standing before the cenotaphs of Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan, positioned side by side, eternally resting together. It was a simple yet profound sight, a quiet reminder that even in death, they were inseparable. The hall was filled with a silence that felt almost sacred. Tourists moved quietly, as though afraid to disturb the peace that seemed to envelop the space. I stood there for a long time, reflecting on the idea of love so powerful that it could transcend life itself, manifesting in a monument that would stand for centuries. As I stepped out of the mausoleum, the late afternoon sun was beginning to dip lower in the sky, casting a golden glow over the entire complex. The Taj Mahal seemed to shift with the changing light, its marble taking on shades of pink and orange, as if it were alive and breathing. It was a moment of pure magic, a fleeting but unforgettable transformation. Looking around, I couldn't help but feel connected to something greater. The Taj Mahal wasn't just a monument to a single love story, it was a symbol of the enduring power of love in all its forms. It reminded me that love, in its purest essence, could inspire the most extraordinary acts, and that its beauty could be captured in both the grandest and simplest gestures. I wandered back through the gardens, taking in the sight of the Yamuna River flowing peacefully behind the Taj. The river, like time itself, moved steadily forward, but the Taj remained still, defying the passage of centuries. It was as if this place existed outside of time, suspended in a moment of eternal grace. As dusk fell, the crowds began to thin, and I found a quiet bench to sit on. The Taj Mahal, now bathed in the soft hues of twilight, looked almost ethereal. The marble seemed to glow from within, as if illuminated by the love that had brought it into existence. I realized then that the true beauty of the Taj was not just in its physical grandeur, but in the emotions it stirred within all who came to witness it. I closed my eyes for a moment, listening to the quiet murmur of the evening. In my mind's eye, I could see Shah Jahan standing beside me, gazing at the monument he had built for his beloved. I imagined the pride and sorrow in his heart, knowing that while she was gone, their love had been immortalized in the most breathtaking way possible. As the first stars appeared in the sky, I took one last look at the Taj Mahal. It felt almost dreamlike now, a vision suspended between earth and sky. I stood up, my heart full, knowing that this visit had been more than just a journey to a famous site. It had been a pilgrimage to the heart of a love story that had transcended time. With a final glance, I walked toward the exit, the silhouette of the Taj fading behind me.
but its memory stayed with me, a reminder of the enduring power of love, beauty, and the legacy that one man's devotion could leave behind for the world to marvel at. The moment I arrived in Kashmir, I could feel the crispness of the mountain air against my skin. It was unlike any place I'd ever been, with towering snow-capped peaks rising all around. The valleys were lush and green, but my excitement was all for the snow, which was forecasted to fall later that evening. The locals assured me it would be magical, and I could barely contain my anticipation. As I walked through the charming streets of Srinagar, the scent of fresh pine and the earthy smell of the cold air filled my lungs. The Dal Lake glistened under the afternoon sun, and Shakaras, traditional wooden boats, drifted lazily across its surface. I took a ride across the lake, marveling at the beauty of the houseboats and the snow-dusted mountains in the distance, while feeling the chill in the air that hinted at the approaching snowfall. By late afternoon, the skies had begun to darken. The clouds gathered over the peaks, their edges soft and heavy with the promise of snow. I found myself in Golmarg, a town known for its breathtaking winter landscapes. It felt like the perfect place to witness my first real snowfall. The gondola ride to the higher slopes was thrilling, the scenery below transforming into a frozen wonderland as we climbed. As evening approached, the first flake drifted down, delicate and soft. It landed on my outstretched hand, melting almost instantly. Then more came, falling gently at first, before gradually turning into a steady flurry. I stood still, in awe, as the world around me transformed. The trees, already bare, were soon blanketed in white, and the ground softened under the growing layer of snow. The sight was pure magic. The falling snow muffled the world, making everything feel serene and quiet. Each flake seemed to dance in the air, swirling in the breeze before settling gracefully onto the earth. I let out a breath and watched it form a cloud in the cold air, feeling like a child witnessing something truly enchanting for the first time. As night fell, the snow continued to descend turning Gulmarg into a winter fairy tale. I found a small cafe nearby, where I could sit by the window and watch the snowfall outside. The warmth from the fire inside made the moment even cozier. A cup of Kashmiri kawa, rich with spices and saffron, warmed my hands as I sipped and looked out at the snow-covered landscape, feeling incredibly at peace. The next morning, I woke up early, eager to explore. The world outside was draped in a thick, pristine layer of snow glistening under the morning light. Every tree, rooftop, and path was covered in soft white powder, untouched and perfect. I set out, crunching through the snow, feeling its softness underfoot. The air was crisp and cold, and the sky had cleared, leaving behind a brilliant blue backdrop. I decided to try my hand at skiing, something I'd never done before. The slopes of Gulmarg were famous for their beauty and challenge. As I glided down the gentle hills, I could see the vast expanse of snow stretching out before me. Though I stumbled a few times, each fall was cushioned by the powdery snow, and the exhilaration of speeding down the mountainside made it all worth it. In the afternoon, I took a quiet walk through the pine forests nearby. The snow was deeper here, and each step made a satisfying crunch. The trees were laden with snow, their branches drooping under the weight, creating a canopy of white. It felt like walking through a storybook, with nothing but the sound of snow falling gently around me. As I stood in the middle of the forest, a sense of calm washed over me. The snow had a way of making everything feel still and peaceful, like the world had paused just for a moment. It was a feeling of tranquility I had never experienced before, as if the snow was cleansing everything around it, leaving only beauty in its wake. By evening, I found myself back at Dow Lake. The lake, which had been glistening with sunlight the day before, was now partially frozen, with thin sheets of ice forming along the edges. The snow continued to fall softly, and I took another Shirkara ride, this time in the falling snow. The stillness of the lake, combined with the softly falling flakes, created a scene so perfect, it felt unreal. The trip was everything I had hoped for and more. The experience of seeing snowfall for the first time in Kashmir felt like stepping into a dream, something I had always imagined but never truly grasped until now. The beauty of the snow-covered landscapes, the calm of the forests, and the warmth of the local people made it a journey I would never forget. As I packed my bags and prepared to leave, I found myself lingering by the window, watching the last few flakes drift down. Kashmir had given me more than just snowfall, it had given me a memory of peace and beauty that would stay with me forever.
Even as I left, I knew that a part of me would always remain there, among the snow and mountains. As the plane took off and the snow-covered peaks faded into the distance, I smiled, already dreaming of the day I would return to the land where snowfalls felt like poetry come to life. The morning air was crisp as I set out to visit the Great Wall of China. I had heard countless tales of its grandeur, but nothing could have prepared me for the sheer magnificence that awaited. Stretching endlessly across the rugged mountains, the wall stood like a sleeping dragon, winding its way into the horizon. As I arrived at the Beidoling section, one of the most well-preserved and popular spots, the first sight of the wall took my breath away. Built of stone and bricks, its undulating form seemed to rise and fall with the very shape of the mountains, a harmonious blend of human engineering and nature. The climb began. With each step, I felt the weight of history beneath my feet. Centuries ago, soldiers and workers would have walked these same stones, protecting China from invading forces. Their presence lingered in the cool air, as though the wall itself was whispering their stories. Looking out over the vast landscape, I could see why this structure had been so effective in defense. The steep ridges, the sharp drops, and the sweeping valleys made the wall a formidable barrier. It wasn't just a wall, it was a masterpiece of strategy, designed to blend into and dominate the land. As I reached one of the watchtowers, I imagined the guards stationed there, scanning the horizon for signs of approaching enemies. The tower, once a hub of activity, now stood silent, a relic of ancient warfare. Its weathered stone walls told stories of Mongol invasions and fierce battles fought in the shadows of these mountains. Continuing my ascent, I passed several other travelers. Some were lost in the same awe as I was, while others struggled with the steep climb. The uneven steps, some tall and others shallow, made the journey unpredictable, much like the history of the wall itself. The legend of Meng Jiangnu crossed my mind. They say she was a woman whose husband was conscripted to work on the wall. When he died due to the harsh conditions, her sorrow was so immense that her tears caused a section of the wall to collapse. This story gave the wall a human dimension, a reminder of the many lives it had touched. Reaching a higher point, I paused to rest. The view was nothing short of spectacular. The wall snaked away into the distance, disappearing and reappearing along the jagged mountains. It was as if it was alive, breathing with the rhythm of the earth itself. As I continued, I found myself wondering about the countless laborers who had built this marvel. Constructed over many dynasties, from the Qin to the Ming, it required unimaginable effort and sacrifice. Many of these workers never returned home, their lives claimed by the unforgiving terrain and harsh conditions. At one point, I ventured to a more remote, crumbling section of the wall. Here, the stone was rougher, and the vegetation had begun to reclaim parts of the structure. I felt as if I had stepped back in time, walking through a forgotten world where the hands of men and the forces of nature had battled for control. The wind picked up as I reached another watchtower. It howled through the narrow windows, filling the tower with a haunting melody. It felt as if the wall was speaking, not in words, but in the rustle of the wind and the creaking of ancient stone. As the sun began its descent, the wall took on a golden hue. The shadows grew longer, stretching across the landscape like fingers reaching into the past. Standing there, I realized that the Great Wall was more than just a fortification. It was a symbol of perseverance, strength, and endurance. I walked a bit further, reflecting on how the wall had changed over the centuries. Once a military barrier, it now stood as a cultural monument, a place where people from all over the world came to witness its beauty and learn its history. As dusk settled in, I made my way back down. The wall, now bathed in soft twilight, seemed to pulse with the energy of the ages. It had stood witness to emperors, invaders, and countless generations, and yet here it was, still standing, still guarding its secrets. As I left the wall behind, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of admiration. It was not just a wall of stone and brick, it was a living, breathing part of history, stretching across the centuries and connecting all those who had ever laid eyes on it. The Great Wall of China, in all its glory, had woven its way into my heart.
The day began with the usual Delhi hustle, streets filled with the sounds of honking cars, the aroma of street food, and the bright sunlight filtering through a slight haze. Today, I was about to explore one of India's most iconic monuments, the Red Fort. As I approached the fort, its imposing red sandstone walls immediately caught my attention. Rising majestically against the skyline, the fort stood as a testament to Delhi's rich history. I could sense the grandeur of the Mughal Empire long before I even stepped inside. After passing through the towering Lahori Gate, I found myself in the Chata Chowk, an arched arcade bustling with vendors selling souvenirs. The lively atmosphere made me imagine what it must have been like centuries ago when merchants sold their wares here to Mughal nobles. Moving forward, I entered the Nabat Kenna, the drum house, where musicians used to announce the arrival of emperors. As I stood there, the thought of Mughal royalty being heralded by the rhythmic beats of drums filled me with awe. The Diwan Iam was my next stop, a stunning hall with rows of pillars where the emperor would address the common people. As I walked through it, I could almost visualize Emperor Shah Jahan sitting on the marble throne, hearing petitions from his subjects. From there, I made my way to the Diwan Ikaz, where the emperor met his nobles and ministers. The delicate inlay work, once encrusted with gems, spoke of the lavishness of the Mughal court. The famous Persian inscription, If there is a paradise on earth, it is here, it is here, it is here, felt fitting. Wandering deeper into the fort, I found myself at the Rang Mahal, the Palace of Colors. Its beautiful arches and water channels painted a picture of the opulence in which the royal women lived. It was easy to imagine the vibrant hues that must have once filled the space. The peaceful atmosphere of the Modi Masjid, a private mosque built by Aurangzeb, gave me a moment of quiet reflection. Its pristine white marble stood in contrast to the red sandstone of the fort, adding a sense of serenity to the bustling complex. One of the highlights of my visit was exploring the gardens. The Hadat Baksh Bagh, or the life-bestowing garden, with its carefully designed waterways and pavilions, gave me a glimpse into the Mughal's love for nature and beauty. I could see how it must have been an oasis of tranquility. As I roamed the expansive grounds, I came across the remnants of British colonial influence, including barracks and offices they built when the fort was used as a military garrison. It was a stark reminder of how this monument has witnessed layers of history. The architectural brilliance of the fort left me spellbound, but it was the stories hidden within the walls that fascinated me most. From the Mughal emperors who ruled in splendor to the British who took control, each stone seemed to whisper a piece of India's past. As the sun began to set, the red fort glowed in a warm orange hue. I took a moment to sit on a bench and soak in the atmosphere. The day had passed quickly, and yet I felt as though I had been transported through centuries of history. Before leaving, I attended the light and sound show, which beautifully narrated the fort's history. With the fort illuminated and the voices recounting the tales of emperors and conquerors, it was the perfect ending to my visit. Walking out of the Lahori Gate, I turned back for one last look at the Red Fort. It stood there, stoic and silent, as it has for centuries, guarding the stories of India's rise and fall. As I made my way back into the modern streets of Delhi, I realized that while the city outside had changed dramatically, within the Red Fort, Time had seemingly stood still, preserving the grandeur and history for generations to come. As the early morning mist cleared, I stepped onto the cobbled streets of Constantinople, the majestic city where East meets West. The golden domes gleamed in the sunlight, promising an adventure steeped in history and culture. The scent of spice and salt from the nearby Bosphorus filled the air, igniting my curiosity. My first stop was the Grand Hagia Sophia. From the moment I entered, I was enveloped by its grandeur. The towering domes and intricate mosaics spoke of a city that had once been the seat of two mighty empires. Standing beneath its vast ceiling, I marveled at the seamless fusion of Byzantine and Ottoman influences. Outside, the city pulsed with life. Merchants called out in the bustling bazaars, offering everything from Turkish carpets to aromatic herbs. 
I strolled through the Grand Bazaar, a labyrinth of treasures where every turn seemed to lead me deeper into the heart of Constantinople's vibrant soul. The call to prayer echoed from the minarets of the Blue Mosque, drawing me in. Inside, I was struck by the tranquility that contrasted with the city's hustle outside. The walls, adorned with blue as nick tiles, created a serene atmosphere that made me pause and reflect on the centuries of faith that had passed through these doors. Later that afternoon, I found myself at Topkapi Palace, once the opulent home of sultans. Walking through its lush courtyards and grand halls, I could almost hear the whispers of the royal court. The view of the Bosphorus from the palace gardens was breathtaking, a reminder of Constantinople's strategic importance throughout history. As the sun began to set, I boarded a boat to cruise along the Bosphorus. The city's skyline unfolded before me, revealing layers of history and its architecture. From ancient Byzantine walls to Ottoman mansions, Constantinople seemed like a living museum, each era adding its own chapter. The next morning, I ventured to the ancient Hippodrome, imagining the chariot races and grand spectacles that once took place there. The obelisk of Theodosius still stood proudly, a relic of Constantinople's Roman past, its carvings telling stories of a distant time. I wandered further into the city and stumbled upon the Basilica Cistern, an underground marvel. The cool, damp air greeted me as I descended the steps. Lit softly, the rows of ancient columns reflected in the still water, creating an almost dreamlike atmosphere. The Medusa heads at the base of two columns added a touch of mystery. Lunchtime brought me to a small cafe by the water. I ordered a traditional Turkish meal, succulent kebabs, flaky borek, and rich, dark coffee. As I ate, I watched the boats bob along the Golden Horn, feeling like I had slipped back in time to an era of caravans and trade routes. Refreshed, I set out to explore the walls of Constantinople, the great fortifications that had protected the city for centuries. Walking along their weathered stones, I imagined the sieges and battles they had withstood, particularly the famous fall of the city in 1453. The city's history continued to unfold as I visited the Church of Cora, known for its beautiful Byzantine mosaics and frescoes. The vivid colors and detailed artistry told stories from the life of Christ, offering a window into the religious devotion that had shaped the city. In the evening, I headed to Galata Tower. From its top, I took in a panoramic view of the city, stretching from the Golden Horn to the distant shores of Asia. The twinkling lights of the city below created a magical ambience, as if the ancient and the modern were dancing together in perfect harmony. My last day in Constantinople began with a visit to the Spice Bazaar. The air was thick with the scent of saffron, cumin, and cinnamon. I found myself lost in the vibrant colors of spices, dried fruits, and sweets. The bazaar felt like the heart of the city's trading spirit, alive with stories of merchants from across the globe. Nearby, I explored the neighborhoods of Frener and Ballot. These districts, with their narrow streets and colorful houses, felt like a step into a different era. The blend of Orthodox Christian and Jewish influences was palpable as ancient churches and synagogues dotted the streets. I ended my journey with a visit to the shores of the Golden Horn, where I sat quietly, watching the sun dip behind the skyline. The water shimmered in the fading light, and for a moment, I felt a deep connection to this ancient city that had witnessed so much. As I prepared to leave Constantinople, I realized how much the city had changed me. It was more than a city. It was a mosaic of civilizations, where every corner held a piece of the past waiting to be uncovered. My time here was a journey through time itself, from the grandeur of the Byzantine Empire to the splendor of the Ottoman rule. Constantinople had shown me that history is not just found in books, but in the streets, the walls, and the people who call this place home. I left Constantinople with a heart full of memories, each one a piece of the city's intricate tapestry. As my boat sailed away across the Bosphorus, I glanced back at the skyline one last time, already knowing that one day, I would return to this timeless city. It began when I wandered off the familiar path in the forest, drawn by the sound of distant laughter. The trees around me shimmered with a strange light, and the air felt lighter, almost electric. I hadn't intended to stray far, 
but curiosity pulled me deeper into the woods until I stumbled upon a small, hidden arch made of twisted vines and glowing flowers. Without thinking, I stepped through it. The moment I crossed the threshold, the forest transformed around me. The sky above was no longer the muted gray of an overcast day but a soft lavender hue, with wisps of gold-tinted clouds swirling lazily. The air was fragrant with the smell of wildflowers, and the sunlight danced across the ground in iridescent beams, giving everything a gentle glow. I realized with a gasp that I was no longer in the world I knew. Everywhere I looked, the surroundings shimmered with an otherworldly beauty. Trees taller than I'd ever seen rose above me, their bark a deep silver, their leaves like liquid gold. Their branches swayed gently, though there was no wind, creating a soft melody that filled the air. As I walked further, delicate creatures darted past, tiny winged beings, their translucent wings catching the light like prisms. Fairies, I thought in awe. They were laughing, their voices like tinkling bells. Some flew in circles above my head, while others danced upon the petals of enormous flowers that seemed to open and close with their movements. The ground beneath me was covered in soft, velvety moss that shifted colors as I walked, from vibrant greens to soothing blues and purples. Wildflowers, larger and more radiant than any I'd ever seen, grew in clusters, their petals glowing faintly in the light. The whole place seemed to hum with life, an energy that was both gentle and overwhelming. I followed a stream that wound through the forest, its water crystal clear, running over smooth iridescent stones. Fish with scales like tiny jewels swam lazily beneath the surface, their colors changing with each flick of their fins. Occasionally, I saw larger creatures, deer with antlers that glittered like stars, rabbits with fur that shimmered in pastel shades, moving peacefully through the woods. Suddenly, I came upon a clearing where the ground seemed to dip slightly, forming a natural amphitheater. In the center, a large pool of water sparkled like liquid silver. Surrounding the pool were more fairies, larger this time, with wings that resembled the wings of butterflies, painted with all the colors of the rainbow. They moved gracefully around the pool, singing a melody so beautiful it brought tears to my eyes. One of the fairies noticed me and beckoned me forward. Her eyes were a brilliant green, and her smile was kind. Welcome, she said, her voice like a soft breeze. You found your way to the realm of the Fae, a world hidden from most. I could barely speak, still overwhelmed by the beauty and magic of it all. How, how is this place real? I finally managed to ask. She laughed softly, the sound warm and musical. This world exists alongside your own, but only those with open hearts and curious minds can enter it. You have wandered here by chance, but it is no accident. She invited me to sit by the pool, and as I did, I watched the water ripple and shimmer, casting light onto the surrounding trees. The other fairies smiled and continued their dance, their wings catching the light in dazzling displays of color. The fairy beside me spoke again. Our world is one of balance and harmony, where nature thrives and magic flows freely. Time moves differently here. What feels like hours might only be moments in your world. I listened, entranced, as she told me of their lives, their connection to the earth, and how they lived in perfect harmony with all living things. She explained that every tree, every stone, and every creature in their realm had a spirit, a voice that could be heard if one listened closely enough. As she spoke, I felt a deep sense of peace wash over me, as if I had finally found a place where everything made sense, where beauty and kindness ruled, and the troubles of the world faded away. I marveled at the way the light danced around us, creating an ethereal glow that made everything feel like a dream. Eventually, she stood and extended her hand to me. Come, there is more to see. We walked deeper into the forest, where we came upon a grand tree, its trunk as wide as a house with roots that twisted and wove into intricate patterns across the forest floor. At its base was a doorway, glowing softly. She led me inside, and I found myself in a hall made entirely of shimmering leaves and vines. The ceiling stretched high above, covered in glowing stars that seemed to move like the night sky. This was the heart of their world, she explained. A place of learning, of magic, and of gathering. Here, the fairies worked their magic, ensuring that their world and the human world stayed in balance, though most humans had forgotten about them. Time seemed to slow as I explored their world. Hours passed like minutes, and every moment was filled with awe and wonder. 
I met other creatures, gnomes, sprites, and even a graceful, deer-like being with antlers that glittered like diamonds. But all too soon, the fairy who had first welcomed me told me it was time to return. Our world is not meant to hold humans for long, she said gently. But now that you've seen it, you will carry a piece of it with you always. Reluctantly, I followed her back to the archway where I had entered. As I stepped through, the lavender sky faded back to the gray of the human world, and the shimmering trees returned to their ordinary forms. I turned back, hoping to catch one last glimpse, but the archway was gone. Now, as I sit here, the memory of that world lingers, like the scent of wildflowers after a rain. I may never return, but I know that somewhere, just beyond the veil of the ordinary, the world of the fairies still thrives, waiting for those brave enough to find it. Last night, I found myself wandering deep into the forest, a place where the trees loomed so tall and thick they blotted out the moonlight. I hadn't intended to go there, but something drew me in, an unspoken pull I couldn't resist. The deeper I went, the heavier the air became, dense with the smell of damp earth and decay. As I ventured further, an unsettling silence crept over the woods. Not a single bird, insect, or rustling leaf disturbed the air. It was unnatural. I should have turned back then, but curiosity, or something darker, pushed me on. I soon noticed the trees had begun to change. Their bark looked gnarled, twisted like they were screaming in frozen agony. Shadows danced between them, though no wind stirred. It was as if the forest itself was watching, waiting. I stumbled upon a narrow path that wound through the trees like a serpent. Against my better judgment, I followed it, the unease building in my chest. The path was lined with strange, crude symbols carved into the trees, symbols I didn't recognize, but felt in my bones. They whispered something dark, something ancient. Then, I saw it, a figure standing at the edge of the path, just ahead. Tall and unnaturally still, cloaked in shadow. I froze, heart pounding. It didn't move, didn't breathe. I took a step back, but my foot landed on a branch, snapping it loudly. The figure's head turned slowly, fixing its gaze on me. Its eyes glowed faintly in the dark, a sickly yellow light that made my blood run cold. I couldn't make out its face, but I knew whatever it was, it wasn't human. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my legs felt rooted to the spot. Without warning, it started gliding toward me, moving too fast for something so still moments before. I finally managed to break free from my paralysis and bolted down the path, heart hammering in my chest, the sound of its pursuit echoing behind me. The path twisted and turned, and I nearly lost my footing several times, but I didn't dare stop. I could hear its ragged breathing now, too close, far too close. I veered off the path and crashed through the underbrush, hoping to lose it in the thick of the woods. I stumbled into a clearing, gasping for breath. The figure was nowhere in sight. For a moment, I thought I'd escaped. But as I looked around, I realized this wasn't a place of safety. The clearing was ringed with those same strange symbols, etched into the ground in a perfect circle. A cold dread washed over me. The air felt wrong here, heavier, like the forest was holding its breath. The shadows seemed to move on their own, swirling around the clearing like they were alive. And then I heard it, whispering voices, rising from the ground, from the trees, from everywhere. Before I could react, the figure reappeared at the edge of the clearing, but it wasn't alone. More shadows materialized from the trees, their glowing eyes piercing the darkness. They surrounded me, their whispers growing louder, incomprehensible, maddening. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. My body felt cold, numb, as if the life was being drained from me. The shadows closed in, their eyes locking onto mine, filling my mind with images of things too horrifying to comprehend. I was drowning in fear in darkness. Just when I thought it was the end, I woke up, gasping for air. I was in my bed, drenched in sweat, heart racing. The forest was gone, the shadows a distant memory. But as I glanced out my window, I saw them, the same symbols, faintly glowing, carved into the trees outside my house. I haven't left my room since. I don't know if I'm still dreaming, or if the forest followed me home. 
but I can feel it, lurking just beyond the edge of the light, waiting for night to fall again. One warm afternoon, I found myself on a dusty road leading to a remote village nestled in the hills. I had heard about this village from a friend who spoke of its tranquility, old-world charm, and the friendliness of its people. As I walked further from the main road, the buzz of the city life grew fainter, replaced by the hum of nature. The sky above was a perfect expanse of blue, with a few lazy clouds drifting by. I could see the roofs of the village houses peeking through the treetops in the distance, and the promise of peace washed over me like a gentle breeze. As I entered the village, the first thing I noticed was the scent of fresh earth and wildflowers. The houses were small, made of stone and wood, each one seemingly unique with its own distinct character. A few children ran past me, laughing and playing with sticks, their bare feet kicking up the dirt. They glanced at me curiously, and one of them waved shyly. I waved back, feeling instantly welcomed. Ahead, I spotted an elderly woman sitting on her porch, knitting with care. She looked up as I passed, offering a warm smile, and I nodded in greeting. I continued exploring, the village unfolding like a storybook. I wandered past a small market where locals sold vegetables, fruits, and handmade crafts. The market buzzed with quiet activity, unlike the noisy city markets I was used to. The villagers greeted one another with warmth, exchanging conversations as they went about their day. I stopped by a stall where an old man was selling honey. He told me the bees were from the nearby forests, and the honey had a rich, golden hue. He offered me a taste, and it was the sweetest honey I'd ever had, infused with the fragrance of wildflowers. The village seemed timeless, as though it existed in a world separate from the rushing pace of modern life. There were no cars or buses, just the occasional bicycle or a horse-drawn cart. People moved slowly, deliberately, as though savoring each moment. I felt my own heartbeat slow, matching the rhythm of life around me. There was something calming in the simplicity, no one was in a hurry, and the world seemed to move in sync with nature. I followed a narrow path that led me to the village square, where a stone well stood at the center. A few women were drawing water, chatting softly amongst themselves. Surrounding the square were more stone houses, their windows adorned with colorful curtains and flower pots. The village church, small but dignified, stood to one side, its bell tower casting a long shadow as the afternoon sun began to lower. I could hear the faint rustle of leaves in the breeze and the distant chirping of birds, adding to the peaceful atmosphere. Feeling the urge to explore further, I followed a trail that led out of the village and up a hill. The path was lined with tall, ancient trees that seemed to whisper secrets as I passed by. At the top of the hill, I was greeted by a breathtaking view. Below me, the village looked like a painting, with smoke rising lazily from chimneys and fields stretching out in every direction. Beyond the fields, the mountains loomed, their peaks tinged with the soft glow of the setting sun. I sat on a rock, taking it all in. For the first time in a long while, I felt completely at peace. There were no emails to check, no calls to answer, no schedules to keep. It was just me the village, and the endless horizon. Time seemed to stretch, and I let myself be absorbed by the beauty and stillness of the moment. A shepherd passed by with his flock, nodding and greeting, and I waved back, feeling a sense of belonging in this quiet corner of the world. As evening fell, I made my way back down to the village. The smell of cooking filled the air, and I could see families gathering for dinner. I was invited by a family to join them for a meal, and though I hesitated at first, their warmth was impossible to resist. We sat around a wooden table, sharing stories and laughter as we ate a simple but delicious meal of stew, bread, and fresh vegetables from their garden. The fire crackled in the hearth, casting a soft glow over the room. By the time I left their home, the village was bathed in moonlight. The night was calm, with only the sound of crickets and the occasional bark of a dog breaking the silence. I walked back to my small guest house, feeling a deep sense of contentment. The village had shown me a different way of life, one that was slower, more connected to the earth and to each other. That night, as I lay in bed, 
I realized that I had come to the village seeking peace, but I had found something more. I had found a place where life was lived fully, where people took the time to appreciate the simple joys of each day. It was a lesson I carried with me long after I left the village, a reminder that sometimes, the best things in life are found in the quietest of places. It was a rainy afternoon when I first met Hazel. She was standing under a tree, trying to shield herself from the downpour. I offered her my umbrella, and that simple act of kindness changed my life forever. Hazel had the brightest eyes, filled with warmth and curiosity. We struck up a conversation, and before long, we were laughing like old friends. There was something magnetic about her, something that made me feel like I had known her forever. Over the next few weeks, we saw each other often. Coffee dates, long walks, and endless conversations drew us closer. Every moment with Hazel felt effortless, and it wasn't long before I realized I was falling for her. But as we grew closer, I began to notice the tension in her eyes whenever her family came up. One day, she confessed that her parents had very strict views about whom she should date. Her family came from a conservative background, and I didn't fit the mold they had in mind for Hazel's future partner. They want someone from the same community, she said quietly, her eyes filled with worry. I told her that I didn't care about the obstacles. What mattered was how we felt about each other. Hazel smiled softly, but I could see the uncertainty lingering in her heart. The first time I met her family, things didn't go well. Her father barely spoke to me, and her mother eyed me with suspicion. It was clear that I wasn't welcome. Despite the cold reception, Hazel and I continued to see each other. We were determined to make it work, even though her family was against us. Each meeting felt like we were sneaking around, afraid of getting caught. One evening, Hazel's father found out about one of our secret meetings. He was furious, and Hazel was grounded for weeks. It felt like the world was against us. I tried to reach out to her parents, explaining how much I cared for Hazel, but they wouldn't listen. You don't belong in her life, her father told me bluntly. Days turned into weeks, and it seemed like there was no way forward. But Hazel and I refused to give up. We knew what we had was special, and we weren't willing to let anyone take that away from us. One evening, Hazel showed up at my door, tears streaming down her face. I don't know what to do, she whispered. They're never going to accept us. I held her close, reassuring her that no matter what happened, we would find a way. Love isn't supposed to be easy, I told her, but it's worth fighting for. Eventually, Hazel's parents realized that no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't break us apart. We were stronger together, and we weren't willing to give up on each other. Hazel's mother was the first to soften. She saw how happy we made each other, and one day, she approached me with a cautious smile. I see how much she cares for you, she said quietly. Her father was more stubborn. It took months of persistence, countless conversations, and the unwavering support of Hazel's mother for him to finally come around. I may not fully understand this, her father said one evening, but if Hazel believes in you, I won't stand in the way. It was the closest thing to approval I could have hoped for. Hazel and I were overjoyed. It felt like a weight had been lifted, and for the first time, we could be together without fear or secrecy. We spent the next few months planning our future. Her family slowly warmed up to the idea, and by the time we decided to make it official, they were there, standing by our side. On the day we got married, I saw Hazel's father smile for the first time. It had been a long and difficult journey, but love had triumphed. Hazel and I were finally united, with her family's blessing. Visiting Machu Picchu was a dream come true. The moment I stepped off the train in Aguas Calientes, a sense of awe washed over me. The mist-shrouded mountains, towering over the valley, felt like they were hiding secrets that had stood the test of time. The journey up to Machu Picchu itself was an experience I'll never forget. I opted to take the bus along the winding mountain roads, each turn revealing more of the breathtaking landscape. The anticipation built with every minute, knowing that I was getting closer to one of the most iconic places on Earth. 
As soon as I stepped through the entrance and caught my first glimpse of the ancient city, I was struck by its sheer magnificence. Nestled between jagged peaks, the stone structures seemed to emerge naturally from the mountainside. The harmony between nature and the Incan architecture was stunning. The early morning mist still lingered, adding an air of mystery to the site. I could almost feel the presence of those who had lived here centuries ago, working, worshipping, and thriving in this isolated wonder. It was as if time had stood still. Walking through the terraces, I marveled at the ingenuity of the Incas. Their ability to cultivate crops on such steep, mountainous terrain was impressive. Each level was carefully engineered, and I could imagine the hard work that went into maintaining these fields. One of the highlights was reaching the Intihuatana, the stone pillar believed to have been used as an astronomical calendar. Standing before it, I couldn't help but think of the precision and deep understanding of the cosmos that the Incas must have had. Climbing to the Sun Gate was another unforgettable part of the experience. The path was steep and challenging, but the reward was worth it. From the top, I could see the entire city of Machu Picchu spread out below me, framed by the soaring Andes. It felt like I was on top of the world. Despite the number of visitors, there were moments of complete solitude. I found a quiet spot near the sacred plaza where I could sit and take in the silence, broken only by the distant calls of birds and the rustle of the wind. It was a time for reflection, a chance to connect with the ancient energy of the place. As I wandered through the Temple of the Sun, the craftsmanship and reverence for the sun god, Inti, were palpable. The precision of the stonework was unlike anything I had ever seen, perfectly aligned with the solstices and the natural environment. I took my time exploring every corner of the site, from the royal tomb to the temple of the condor. Each structure had its own story, its own mystery. The stonework, the alignment with the stars, the location, it all felt deliberate, like Machu Picchu was more than just a city, but a living testament to the Incan way of life. The views from every angle were breathtaking. The lush green peaks rising into the sky, the winding river far below, it all contributed to the otherworldly atmosphere of the place. Every step I took, the beauty around me seemed to deepen. One of my most surreal moments came when a llama wandered up to me. These gentle creatures roam freely across the ruins, adding to the sense of timelessness. I couldn't resist taking a picture with my new furry friend against the backdrop of the ancient stone walls. As the day wore on, the light began to change, casting long shadows across the ruins. The golden hue of the late afternoon sun bathed the city in a warm, ethereal glow. It was hard to leave knowing I might never see Machu Picchu like this again. Before heading back to Aguas Calientes, I sat for one last time, gazing out at the mountains. The beauty and mystery of Machu Picchu had left a lasting impression on me. It wasn't just a place I had visited, it was an experience that had touched my soul. Even now, when I close my eyes, I can still see the mist swirling around the ancient stones, feel the cool mountain air on my skin, and hear the quiet whispers of a civilization long gone. Machu Picchu will forever hold a special place in my heart. I've always had a fascination with languages, but English, in particular, was the one I cherished the most. It wasn't just about speaking it, but mastering the art of conversation like a native. One sunny afternoon, I found myself sitting at a quaint cafe in a bustling part of the city. I had been practicing my English for months, eager to test it out with native speakers. As luck would have it, a group of tourists walked in. Their accents, unmistakable. They were from the UK. I took a deep breath. It was time. My heart raced as I approached them with a friendly hello. Do you mind if I join you? I'm practicing my English. To my relief, they smiled and welcomed me. The conversation began slowly, and at first, I could feel the nervousness tinging my words. But as they spoke, I started to relax. I mirrored their accents, trying to sound as natural as possible. You speak really well, one of them said, surprised. I smiled and thanked him, explaining how much I had been practicing and my love for the language. As we continued talking about their travels and my experiences, I noticed that other people in the cafe had started paying attention. It wasn't every day they saw someone speaking English so fluently around here. 
A couple seated nearby exchanged glances, intrigued by the seamless flow of our conversation. I could tell they were listening, and it boosted my confidence even more. The tourists seemed impressed. You sound just like one of us, another remarked, and I could feel a surge of pride. I had worked so hard for this moment. As we laughed and shared stories, I realized I had almost forgotten my initial fear. The rhythm of English felt natural, and I barely had to think before speaking. More people were starting to notice now. Some pretended not to listen, while others openly glanced in our direction. I could feel their curiosity. One of the waiters came by to refill our drinks. He lingered for a second longer than usual, clearly trying to catch a bit of our conversation. It felt strange but empowering. A young couple sitting at the window whispered to each other and gave me a thumbs up when I caught their gaze. I returned the gesture, feeling more confident than ever. The group of tourists asked me for recommendations on places to visit in the city. I was more than happy to help, offering tips while maintaining that polished English accent. As our conversation drew to a close, one of the tourists said, It's been great chatting with you. I didn't expect to meet someone so fluent here. You've really got a gift. The compliment stayed with me as they waved goodbye and left the cafe. I sat back down, glancing around. The attention from the surrounding tables had not gone unnoticed. A man from the next table leaned over and said, Your English is amazing. I've never heard anyone around here speak it so well. I smiled and thanked him, feeling a sense of accomplishment. It wasn't just about speaking English anymore. It was about being noticed, being understood, and having a voice that resonated with people. It was another quiet afternoon in class, and I was sitting at my desk, anxiously waiting for my English lesson to begin. Today felt different. I had been practicing for weeks, and I was ready to impress my teacher. The door creaked open, and in walked my English teacher, Mr. Harrison. He was always warm and encouraging, but he had high expectations. I hoped today would be the day I would exceed them. All right, everyone, Mr. Harrison said, clapping his hands. Today we're going to focus on conversation skills. Let's start by having a dialogue. He scanned the room and paused for a moment before his eyes landed on me. How about you? He asked, a hint of a smile on his face. Are you ready to have a chat with me? My heart started pounding, but I nodded confidently. This was my chance. Yes, I'm ready, I replied, feeling the words roll off my tongue more smoothly than ever before. Mr. Harrison pulled up a chair and sat across from me. Let's talk about something interesting, he said. How about your favorite hobby? Tell me about that. I took a deep breath and launched into a detailed description of my passion for photography. I was careful with my grammar, choosing my words thoughtfully, trying to sound as natural as possible. As I spoke, I noticed Mr. Harrison nodding with interest. His eyes sparkled with approval, and that small gesture gave me the confidence to continue. That's really fascinating, he said after I finished explaining how I like to capture sunsets. You're expressing yourself so well. Your fluency has improved a lot. Hearing that made my chest swell with pride. I smiled and responded, thank you. I've been practicing every day. I want to get better. Well, it's paying off, he said, leaning back in his chair. Your pronunciation is clearer, and your sentences are flowing more naturally. You're becoming more confident in your speech. As we continued talking, I could feel my nerves melting away. We discussed books, travel, and even a few funny anecdotes from his own experiences as a language teacher. At one point, Mr. Harrison chuckled and said, I feel like I'm talking to a native speaker right now. You're that good. His words caught me off guard, but in the best possible way. I had always admired native speakers and their ease with the language, and now my teacher was saying I sounded like one. I've never had a student progress this quickly, he added. You should be really proud of yourself. I was beaming now, unable to hide my excitement. Thank you so much. It means a lot to hear that from you, I said, my voice steady and filled with gratitude. Keep it up, he said, standing up and placing a hand on my shoulder. You have a real talent for this, and with your dedication, there's no limit to how far you can go. 
As the lesson ended, I walked out of the classroom with a renewed sense of confidence and determination. Mr. Harrison's praise echoed in my mind, and I knew that my hard work was truly paying off. I had always been nervous about speaking English with professionals, especially in important situations. But when I scheduled my appointment with Dr. Collins, I knew I had no choice. This was the perfect opportunity to put my English skills to the test. As I sat in the waiting room, I rehearsed in my mind how the conversation might go. I had practiced medical vocabulary, but it was still intimidating knowing I'd have to communicate my symptoms in a second language. You're up next, the nurse called, and I stood up, taking a deep breath. It was time to face the challenge head on. Dr. Collins greeted me with a friendly smile as I walked into the examination room. Good afternoon. How are you feeling today? She asked, her tone calm and professional. I smiled back and replied confidently, Good afternoon, doctor. I've been having some discomfort in my chest for the past few days, and I thought it would be best to get it checked. I was surprised by how smooth my words sounded. Dr. Collins nodded, listening carefully. I see. Can you describe the discomfort? Is it sharp pain or more of a dull ache? I paused for a moment, organizing my thoughts. It's more of a dull ache, especially when I breathe deeply or lie down. It started after I had a cold last week. Dr. Collins scribbled some notes and looked at me with a smile. Your English is excellent, she said. You're describing your symptoms very clearly, which helps me understand exactly what's going on. Her compliment caught me off guard. I hadn't expected such immediate feedback, but it encouraged me to continue the conversation with more confidence. Thank you, I replied, feeling a sense of relief. I've been working hard on improving my English, especially for situations like this. Dr. Collins checked my vitals while continuing to engage me in conversation. Well, you're doing a great job. Many native speakers struggle to explain their symptoms this well. That remark filled me with pride. I had always worried about not being able to communicate properly in such important situations, but here I was, speaking clearly with a doctor. She asked a few more questions about my health history, and I responded without hesitation. My words felt natural, and for the first time, I wasn't second-guessing myself. After the examination, Dr. Collins said, It seems like you might have some residual inflammation from your cold, but nothing too serious. I'll prescribe some medication to help with the discomfort. I nodded, understanding everything she was saying. Thank you for explaining it so clearly, doctor. I appreciate your help. Dr. Collins smiled again. It's my pleasure. And by the way, your English is impressive. You've made this whole process much easier for both of us. Hearing that from a medical professional made me feel accomplished. That means a lot to me, I said. I've been practicing for a while, and I'm glad it's paying off. As I left the clinic, I felt a wave of confidence wash over me. Not only had I managed to communicate effectively in a medical setting, but I had also gained the appreciation of the doctor herself. It was a day I wouldn't forget. When I first started learning English, it felt like an endless maze. I knew some basics, but I couldn't express myself confidently. I decided I had to tackle it step by step if I ever wanted to speak fluently. Grammar was my first challenge. I realized early on that without a solid grasp of grammar, my sentences would always sound awkward. So, I dove into grammar books, studying tenses, sentence structures, and how to use prepositions properly. At first, I made plenty of mistakes. I often confused past and present tenses or used the wrong articles. But with each error, I learned something new. I'd write sentences in my notebook and compare them with examples in books or online. Soon, I started setting aside time each day just to focus on grammar exercises. It was tedious at times, but I could feel myself getting better. I learned that repetition and practice were key to mastering the rules. Once my grammar improved, I turned my attention to pronunciation. This was tricky, especially because English pronunciation doesn't always follow the spelling. I started by listening to native speakers through movies, TV shows, and podcasts. I'd pause after every sentence and mimic what I heard, paying close attention to how they pronounce difficult sounds like 
th, and r. It was frustrating at first. My accent was strong, and I stumbled over certain words. But I didn't give up. I recorded myself speaking and compared it to native speakers. Listening to my own voice made me aware of my weaknesses, and I focused on correcting them one by one. To improve further, I enrolled in an online course that focused on pronunciation. The instructor broke down each sound, and I practiced speaking aloud every day. Slowly, my accent softened, and I became more comfortable with difficult words. One thing that really helped was talking to native speakers whenever I could. I'd engage in conversation with them, and they would kindly correct my pronunciation mistakes. Each correction was a step closer to sounding more natural. Vocabulary was another big challenge. At first, I stuck to simple words because they felt safe. But I knew that to become fluent, I needed a richer vocabulary. So, I started reading everything from novels to news articles. Whenever I encountered a new word, I'd write it down in a notebook and look up its meaning. But I didn't stop there. I also noted how the word was used in different contexts. This helped me understand its nuances. I made flashcards of these words, reviewing them daily. I found that using apps to track my progress made learning new vocabulary more fun and efficient. Another habit I developed was using new words in conversations as soon as I learned them. Whether I was speaking or writing, I tried to incorporate these words naturally. The more I used them, the more confident I felt. Over time, my vocabulary expanded, and I found myself using more complex sentences. This made my conversations feel richer and more engaging. I could now express thoughts that were once difficult to articulate. I also realized that language isn't just about memorizing rules or words, it's about context and culture. So, I immerse myself in English media, I watched documentaries, listened to music, and even followed social media trends to stay updated on slang and idiomatic expressions. Each part of the language, grammar, pronunciation, and vocabulary, started to come together, and I noticed the change in my fluency. Conversations felt more natural, and I no longer hesitated when speaking. People around me began to notice, too. Friends would compliment my improvement, and native speakers would often say, You sound so fluent now. That encouragement motivated me to keep going. Looking back, I realized that my fluency wasn't achieved overnight. It took dedication, practice, and patience. But each step, whether mastering grammar, refining pronunciation, or enriching vocabulary, brought me closer to my goal of speaking English fluently. And now, I finally felt like I could express myself fully. On the edge of a small, forgotten village, there was an old house. No one went near it because strange things happened there at night. The villagers said the house was cursed. They whispered that anyone who entered it would never come back. One cold evening, a young man named Liam decided to explore the house. He didn't believe in curses or ghosts. He wanted to prove everyone wrong. As he approached the house, the wind howled and the trees seemed to groan. The windows of the house were dark, but something inside seemed to be watching him. Liam stepped onto the creaky porch and the door slowly opened by itself. The air inside was heavy and damp and the smell of rot filled his nose. As he entered, the door slammed shut behind him. He turned around, but there was no handle to open it again. Panic crept in. The floorboards beneath his feet groaned with each step. Strange symbols were carved into the walls, and old, dusty portraits hung crookedly, their eyes seeming to follow him. Liam heard a soft whisper, like the wind through the trees, but it came from inside the house. Turn back, it said. He ignored it and moved further in. Suddenly, the lights flickered, and he heard footsteps upstairs. But he knew no one lived there. His heart pounded as he slowly climbed the stairs. At the top of the stairs, the hallway stretched on forever. The wall seemed to close in, and the air grew colder. He heard a door creak open at the end of the hall. He walked toward the door, feeling a chill run down his spine. Inside the room, there was a single chair facing the window, and sitting in it was a woman in a tattered white dress. Her hair was matted, and her head slowly turned toward Liam. Her eyes were black pits, and her mouth opened, 
revealing sharp, broken teeth. You shouldn't have come, she hissed. Her voice was deep and guttural. Before Liam could move, she stood up, her body twitching unnaturally. She lunged at him, but when Liam tried to run, his feet were stuck to the floor. He screamed, but no sound came out. The wall seemed to close in on him. Just as her cold hand reached out to grab him, the house itself began to shake. The ground beneath him split open, and dark hands reached up, pulling him into the floor. Liam was dragged into a pitch-black pit. The air around him was freezing, and he could hear the whispers growing louder. You belong to the house now, they said. As he was swallowed by the darkness, the last thing he saw was the woman's twisted smile, her face hovering above the pit. No one in the village ever saw Liam again, but sometimes on cold, windy nights, villagers could hear his screams coming from the house, begging to be set free.